can't tell you how grateful I am that you're tuning in to Transforming Truth. The message that you're about to hear is from a recent series on the life of Queen Esther, that wonderful, beautiful Jewish woman of ancient history who rose to a prominent position in the kingdom for a God-appointed time and season. So let's get into the Word of God together. Let's talk about Esther and the invisible God who is working powerfully in her life, just like I believe He's working in your life today. Esther 5 verse 1, it says, on the third day, that's the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, And if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And Haman went out that day, joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let gallows 75 feet high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. We move into a time in this study where really the only three characters we're going to be looking diligently at are the three that were in this chapter. You've got Esther, who's the central figure of the entire book, as God has elevated her in grace from the orphan status into being the queen, the highest ranking woman in all of the Persian Empire. And he did that by sovereignly acting on her behalf, invisibly, sometimes silently. But as Esther was obedient and humble, God promoted her to this place of queenship. That had been several years before the chapter we just read. So she is well entrenched in her role as the queen to the king of Persia. The king of Persia is an extremely wealthy man, an extremely powerful man, and an extremely carnal man. Forgive the bluntness of it, but there's only a few things that we see that the king likes in the book of Esther. He likes sex, he likes wine, and he likes food, and he likes money. And that's it. This man is the representative male in what it means to be a man of the world system. And then you have this third individual named Haman. And the more you see of him in this chapter and the chapter to come, the more you're going to find out the the deadly fumes of arrogance and pride that literally stifle out any potential life of God in a person. And so tonight we're going to look at it. We're going to examine it. But let's start with the good news. Let's go to the good news first. And this is Esther. And she motivates me. 
When I look at this woman, I'm thinking, God, raise up a generation of Esthers in my day. Lord, let my wife continue to be the Esther that she is. Let my daughter continue to grow in that Esther-like anointing. And let the women of this mission base really pursue after the quality of character that Esther has. And, And what does that look like? She's not a radical feminist. She doesn't have to become male in order to be powerful and strong. Nor is she a demure a doormat that men wipe their feet on. She's just a simple woman who has a confidence in God and she's embraced her assignment in the life that God's given her. Let's look at her humility tonight. Verses 1 and 2 open up and we're going to see the queen's humility. And let's look, I'm going to give you some context of the situation, but this is the first thing I want you to notice about her. She's in a very severe situation, but she did not exalt herself hastily. Look in verse number 1. It says that on the third day of that fast that she put on her royal robes, She stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. Now, for all of you that like fairy tale stories and you like princes and princesses and kings and queens, and listen, most young girls when they were growing up loved that kind of stuff. That's why Disney has made multiple billions and billions of dollars by putting out the same story with different characters for decade after decade, and they make tons of money. What am I talking about? I'm talking about princesses with princes and kings and queens and royalty. This is a very royal scene. You've got Esther, remember, on the third day of the fast, so she's been fasting for three days, seeking courage, seeking wisdom, seeking the presence of the Lord to go in unto her husband, who is the king of Persia. Now, if you weren't here last time, we found out that if anybody goes into the king's presence without being personally invited, they are entering his presence at the risk of death. Those kings were treated in a way that basically elevated them to the status of gods. And anybody that dared to enter their presence, even the queen, without an invitation, could be executed summarily right there on the spot. And so she is going into this process knowing that it may cost her her life. She testified in chapter 4. She hadn't seen or talked to her husband, the king, in 30 days. So look at what she does. This is a woman using everything that she possibly can to her advantage. What does she do? She, she gets decked out. She puts on the finest clothing she can get. Now remember, we've already made it very clear, and I'm not going to apologize for it. That's what the first couple of chapters reveal about the king. He likes Esther because he is deeply attracted to her face and her body. That is what the scriptures teach. And so Esther is not going to run away from that. She needs the favor of the king. So like a smart woman who is actually seeking something holy in this, she uses everything at her disposal and she wants to ingratiate herself to the king. So she puts on the finest royal outfit possible. She probably gets decked out as completely as she can. And she puts herself in the direct eye line of the king and she just stands there looking all wonderful as the king is sitting on his royal throne he's sitting there on the throne in his own quarters and look at her she's on a mission from God by the way she's got an assignment there are millions of souls on the line but check out what three days of fasting and prayer did for her she's not in a panic She's not trying to make it happen in the energy of the flesh. She is not being dominated by her emotions. She's the picture-perfect illustration of what a spirit-controlled woman looks like in a moment of crisis. I love the fact that we see here biblically a woman and her strength is not being masculine, nor is a woman just being dominated by her emotions and some weakness. She's in control, and you're going to find that out in this whole passage. This woman is in control of everything that's going on in spite of these two very powerful men that she's going to be around so we see in that first verse that she got prepared and then she paused and she waited here's my guess this is not in the bible so feel free to disagree with me this is the way i see it she's prayed she's fasted she's gotten her robes on her servants have helped her look as good as she can she makes her way through the marble courts of the palace she goes towards the the quarters where his he's sitting on his throne in the throne room he is there by himself he's got his servants there but he's sitting on the throne by himself i bet her heart is pounding in her chest and the only thing she can do at this point is wait on god she, she, at this point, she has placed herself in absolute surrender to the sovereign plan of God. 
You know, the scriptures teach us that the hearts of kings are in the hand of the Lord. And like the river of water, he turns their hearts. Esther is in that place where she needs God to turn the heart of her husband, the king, towards her. So let's go down into verse number two and watch this also. I think this is important for all of us, so y'all stay with me here. She honored the system humbly. What am I talking about? There's a system in Persia. There's a governmental, political, royal system. And it says in verse 2, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, boom, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Now, what you've got going on here is the royal order. These, this is the system, this is the tradition, this is the inner workings of how one approaches a Persian king. And she is going straight to the line, straight down the line, to the T, and honoring the system that was in place. And so as she stands there, think about that. Because remember what the fasting and prayer was about. The fasting and prayer was primarily, God help me when I stand before my husband, the king, I, I pray for favor, don't let him kill me. And the Bible says there was a moment where the king saw her and he, she received favor from him. He probably smiled, but at the very least, he extended the royal scepter. It just would have been an ornate, a golden staff that he had. He extended it to her. And look at this. She honors the system to the T. She doesn't rush. She doesn't fall down weeping. She doesn't cry. She doesn't start pleading. She doesn't out Haman at this point. But she goes in obeying the, the whole system of courtly order, and she touches the tip of his scepter, and she honors the system. She honors the process. Why do I even bother bringing that up? Well, let me tell you what I see in our day. How many of you know that there's a lot of systems in play in the culture in which you live that are fouled up? Is the government fouled up? It's kind of fouled up, right? Um, there, there's a whole sub, uh, subculture in America, uh, the sensuality, the sexuality. Listen, I'll even go ahead and, and call it like it is. I, I think for the most part, the American church culture, the system that churches operate on, are, are not in alignment with New Testament, what we see in the early church. And so there's systems everywhere, governmental systems, educational systems, civic systems, ecclesiastical systems. They're everywhere. And what we've got going on in our culture is a lot of people that have become woke. They don't like the system. But notice how most people are going about changing the system. And while you notice them going about it this way, look at how little impact they're actually having. What are they doing? It's anarchy. It's rebellion. It's protest. It's demonstration. I mean, I'm trying to figure out who put the word demon and demonstrator. I mean, I, they're, they're got to be connected because of the vitriol and the hatred and the anger. And it's on the right and it's on the left. And so it's not a, nobody's got a monopoly on um, idiocy. It's everywhere. And so everybody's screaming and the outrage level just increases every day. I've never been a, in, a, in, a, in a, a season in my lifetime. I'm 48 years old. I've never seen it as heated as it is right now. A whole lot of heat and almost zero light. And so that's what's happening all over. Now, let me just say, I, do we have freedom of speech? Right, we absolutely do. Are we allowed to express our opinion? We absolutely do. But if we really want change, it's not going to come through screaming. It's not going to come through anarchy. It's not going to come through successive protests. We, people have been protesting nonstop for about 12 years, it seems like. And if you even want to go back further into the 60s, I mean, we know how to protest around here, but there's not a lot of results coming from it. Why? Because, listen, this is something that we Christians don't like to hear, but it's in the Bible. It doesn't matter who's in the Oval Office. It's in the Bible. The powers that be are ordained of God. Yep, I know. You say, well, <clears throat> the power I wanted in the Oval Office ain't there. Well, listen, it'll probably be different in about uh, two and a half years. And so it, it just works that way. But the reality is this, there's a system in place and very few people topple as systems that are entrenched as to the degree that we have them in our culture. Whether it be the entertainment system, the educational system, whether it be the governmental system or even the ecclesiastical system, the church systems that are out there. Let me tell you how to affect change. Get in the system and work from the inside out. We call that word reformation. 
instead of standing on the sidelines and protesting everything that's wrong, get a little spiritual Trojan horse thing going. Get inside the gates of that system and start affecting change through reasonable, spirit-tempered guidance. When I was talking to the worship team earlier tonight, and I was going back down some ugly paths on memory lane, and we were talking about just uh, some of the challenges that have happened in churches that we've seen, and one of the things that I recognized right after I got saved is a lot of the things that were barked and, and bellowed and, 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 and pounded and amen all the time, I started realizing about a year into my salvation, I was like, hey, I can't find any of this stuff we're all hyped up over. I can't find any of it in the Bible. I, I know you believe it, and I know your daddy believed it, and I know your granddaddy believed it, and I know deacon so-and-so believed it, and I know the old pastor believed it. I know y'all are convinced, but is anybody consecrated? And, and I started just realizing, I was like, oh, there's a system here. Now, that system happened to be Southern religious tradition. And so I, had, I came to a crossroads, and I realized the system has fallen short of the standard. The standard is God's word. The standard is God's heart. The standard is God's character. And so I realized I can either protest, vote with my feet, and walk away, wipe my hands of it, and I help nobody. Or I can stay for the long haul and start affecting change by what? By honoring the system. It doesn't mean I approve of it. Listen, we have to honor a lot of things in life that we don't like. I don't like red lights. I think they're of the devil. Amen? I don't like red lights, but I honor them. I don't always like authority. I don't like paying my taxes, man. That's money that I worked hard for. I want to pay as little of it as I can legally, but I honor the system. Why? Because the system and the powers that be are ordained of God. But if you want to affect change, you have to honor the system while you're in the system, and then you start changing the system. How? By following the leadership of the Lord. Esther's walking into a highly systemized atmosphere of royalty, and she doesn't strut in there as the queen. She doesn't say, put up your scepter, I'm the queen. Look at me, I'm all decked out for you, you got this. She doesn't say anything like that. She goes in humbly, she touches the tip of the scepter and honors the man whose help she needs. I, I just want to say this before moving on. Kingdom wisdom always discerns which traditions to oppose and which traditions to embrace. And just because we don't like a tradition or a system doesn't mean that we have a calling to rebel against it. Sometimes it's a test of our humility. It's a test of our character. If we can abide with some things we don't like and trust the Lord over the long haul to use us to change it. So whether it's the system that you work with when you go in, clock in, 9 to 5 every week, whether it's the system of authority in your community, whether it's the system that, I mean, listen, I don't know anybody. I, I think we have an awesome church. I don't want to be anywhere else. There are some things around here I don't love. So you're not only say, Jeff, you're one of the pastors. That's okay. I, I'm able to cooperate with things that go on in a church that I do not necessarily endorse. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about the glory of God. And if we're ever going to affect change, we have to learn to do more than protest and complain. We have to find out, listen, you're going to be so much more effective if you'll pour out your complaint to the Lord and pour out honor on everybody else. And when you become a person of honor... You get elevated like Esther, and you eventually reach that place where you can affect change. All the people barking and screaming and whining and crying and protesting, and bleh, they just vomit out their rhetoric all the time. I'm going to tell you something. History will never remember them. They'll never remember those people. They're part of the angry masses operating on just emotional fuel. And maybe they're right about some of the issues, but because they fail to honor the system that has been set up long before them, they'll never make a difference. A wise person will take her time, wait on the Lord, look for the opportunity, and start affecting real change from the inside. And that's what this woman does. So she is the bright spot in this chapter. Let's move to the second individual. Let's talk about the king. 
And let's look at his authority in this. The king is a um, massively powerful, wealthy individual. Strongest, stoutest, wealthiest man probably in the world at that time. First of all, verse number three, just by his words, it's very clear that the king had massive resources. He says to Esther, what is it, Queen Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. Now, it's, it's very interesting to me that he knows that she's there for something unusual. He knows there's no way that this, this woman, my wife, the queen, breaks royal protocol by showing up uninvited. There is something up. And yet, I love this because God has turned his heart in favor to Esther. Esther's got favor all over her, by the way. Her whole story is just about abiding in the favor of God. And I think it's deeply connected to her humility before the Lord and her obedience unto Mordecai. I think God honors those that honor authority. And so she has been promoted and elevated. And now the king looks at her. And I mean, just imagine the relief on her heart. She was five seconds earlier, not knowing if she was about to be executed executed right there for breaking protocol by coming in uninvited and now she finds out that the king looks at her he gives her favor and he says hey queen esther what did you come here for today what's your request i'll give you whatever you want even up to the half of my kingdom come on i mean that that's that's good news he said well jeff i don't get it well let me help you so the wealthiest man in the world today even with a bad stock market day is a guy named Jeff Bezos. How many of you know the name Jeff Bezos? Tell me his company. It's Amazon. And so he is 54 years old, and he is worth somewhere between $150 billion to $166 billion. Is there really that big of a difference between the two? I don't know, but those are the two numbers I got. I don't even have a grid for that kind of money. I mean, I, I don't even understand what that was. So I just, I pulled out my calculator. I, I was terrible at math. I never felt like I needed to be good at math because I figured there'd always be a calculator somewhere. And so I pulled out a calculator and I realized a billion is a one with nine zeros. And then I started thinking, how many million are in 160 billion? And this is what I figured out. So if he's got $160 billion, picture a stack of a million dollars. Go ahead, picture it. You're allowed. It's not sinful. I'm calling you to do it. A stack of a million dollars. You know how much 150 billion is? It's 150,000 of those stacks of a million dollars. And that's what Jeff Bezos woke up to this morning. That's how much money he has. He's the wealthiest man in the world. Let me tell you that his wealth today compared to what King Xerxes' wealth was in that day, Jeff Bezos doesn't make the top 10 compared to what uh, uh, Xerxes had. Uh, Some modern economist equated King Solomon's net worth, if he was alive today, to be something like $3 trillion. Those kings were rolling. And the king just looked at Esther and said, hey, ask what you want, I'll give you half of my kingdom. You can have 75,000 stacks of my million dollars. I'll keep the other 75,000 stacks. Why am I saying all this? I'm just saying that Paul would phrase it this way. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. She, the daughter of God, walks in wondering if she's going to die. And the king suddenly wants to be favorable to her. That wasn't just him being Mr. Nice Guy because he's not a nice guy. He's not a good man. It's God giving Esther favor and all of the sudden the relief that comes on her soul. Now listen, we know she didn't go in there for money. She's got a much bigger agenda. She's got an entire people group, her own kinsmen, that she wants to save. So she's not in there for the money. My point being is this. This king, there was nobody above him. And he had unlimited resources. Now go down into verse number four and five. He not only had massive resources, he had unquestionable command. Just look at the words. I want you to remember who we're dealing with here. Esther said, and again, watch her honor the system here. If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, 
immediately. Authority, didn't have to ask permission, didn't have to try to figure out if, if Haman had an appointment. He says, get Haman down here right now. My woman has made us some lunch. Bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. Now, let's not divorce this from the, the context of what's going on. She had been fasting and praying for three days, and somewhere in the middle of the fast, the Holy Spirit communicates to her, make a feast. Make a feast for your husband. Now, the feast would not have simply been, you know, um, tofu, gelatin, and, you know, lettuce wraps. I mean, they knew how to do it up right back then. And they, listen, as much as, you know, our southern sensibilities will be offended at this, they would drink a whole bunch of wine. It was just part of how they rolled. Every time you see a banquet in the book of Esther, and I think there's like four major banquets, something, something significant happens, but it's always with the king, he's got a, I say it this way, he's got a beer in his hand, like half the book of Esther. He's constantly drinking. And so again, she is using what is at her disposal. He likes her body, he likes to eat, and he likes to drink. And so Esther, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is setting something up here. She's not being carnal. She's not doing anything wrong. She is being harmless as a dove while being wise as a serpent. I want to remind us of something here that doesn't get a lot of press in churches. When you get saved, when you come to Jesus Christ and now you are the temple of God, the Holy Spirit of God resides in you, you don't check your brains at the door. You don't stop becoming a thinking person. As a matter of fact, you're living in a world system that requires you, if you're going to survive it, to not operate in a naivete, that you have to be understanding at least on some level about what we're dealing with in this world. This world doesn't like us anymore. Now, I don't want you to send yourself flowers. You're not a victim. But this world does not like biblical Christians anymore. The system is not, oh, good, the Christians are here. They don't like our beliefs. They don't like our politics. They don't like our, our standards. They don't like our morality. They don't like our Bible. They don't like our exclusivism about Jesus being the only way to enter into eternal life. They don't like our messaging. And yet there is still a slice of Christianity that's basically like the, the hard Krishnas at the airport. Let's just hand everybody a little rose and I'm sure they'll like us. Esther's no fool. Esther realizes that if she is going to be able to, to do what she's got to do, she has to operate with some cunning about her. She has to know what she's doing. She has to know what the opposition is. Haman is a... Um, He's a, he's a Holocaust initiator. He's a genocidal maniac. And that is who she is seeking to topple. And the only way she can do it is to get herself aligned with the king, or better yet, more particularly, get the king to align with her. And her emotions aren't going to make that happen. And her own human wisdom is not going to make that happen. So what does she do? She fasts. She prays, she hears from the Lord, and she starts initiating a systematized process in order to bring her plan about. And one of the things that it involves is that she wants the king to be honored. King, if it pleases you. King, if, if, if you will do what I request, if I have found favor in your sight. Go down into verses 6 through 8. Let's look at this. Let's look at his blind spot. Esther is the king's blind spot, but fortunately for him, she's not trying to do him harm. And it's a good thing because he is about as oblivious as a man can get, that he is actually in her hands right now. The Bible says that as they were drinking wine, I told you, after the feast, the king said to Esther, what's your wish? It shall be granted to you. What's your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. So he's repeating the offer. Verse 7, Esther answered, my wish and my request is, and then she pauses, and verse 8, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish, again, look at her honoring the system there. She's still being honorable and reverent to the king. She says, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So this is interesting. We, we can speculate all day long why she didn't just open up right there and say, Haman's a bad guy. 
I need you to exterminate him. You said you'd give me whatever I wanted. I want him dead. She could have said that, and the king would have been bound by oath to his wife, and he likely would have done it, but she didn't do it that way. We don't know why, but she paused, she hesitated. There could be a hundred reasons why, but my personal belief is that the Holy Spirit told her to have two days of feast, and the reason why is next week's message is going to show you why it was so important to have this nighttime between this feast that we're at in chapter 5 and the one that's coming at chapter 6 because God does something ridiculously sovereign in the evening that is going to blow your mind next week. And so Esther says, here's what I really want. I want you to come to another banquet tomorrow. And I'd like for Haman to come. Now watch, she not only knows the king and what pleases him, she knows what pleases Haman. You know what pleases Haman? Flattery, applause, affirmation, adoration. Haman is the man. And so she's puffing up that already over-puffed ego of Haman. And she says, I'd like you both to come tomorrow. Um, let, me, let me just say this. The king had all the money. The king had the position. The king had all of the power. But Esther was running the show. And the king didn't know it. Now, ladies, I want you to hear me on this. Listen. I personally, I said this in the first message of this series, I think it bears repeating now that we're weeks into it. I personally believe that God, and this is a generalization, but I do believe it, that God has given women a strong ability to influence men. Most women do not operate in the Holy Spirit, so they use that influence in a negative way that is nothing other than manipulation. They know how to manipulate a man to get what they want. That's entirely different than influencing a man for the glory of God. So ladies, I want to tell you something. Esther was running the show, and chances are a lesser woman, a woman who wasn't on, a, on an assignment from God, a woman who wasn't um, trained up in the ways of God, she would be using all of that influence she has through her appearance, through her uh, wise, maybe even cunning ways, she would use that to get something for herself at the expense of the king. But that's not what she's doing. She's using all of what God has shown her and the opportunities she has. She is actually taking all of that power and she is doing something that is going to be glorious and still is to this very day for the people of Abraham, for the Jews. The Feast of Purim, you know about that, right? That comes from the book of Esther. And so Esther is someone, ladies, not just the ladies, but let me speak to ladies. This is who you want to be in your character. We have to, this is what I'm talking about, instead of standing on the sidelines and protesting the system, why don't we get into the system and start defining biblically wherever we can, starting in your own heart, sister, what it means to be a woman of God, what it means to be a woman of strength, what it means to be a woman of influence, what it means to use everything at your disposal, not for manipulation, but in order to bring glory to God and betterment to other people. That is who you were made to be. And I don't have a problem saying that a godly woman... Uh, let me say it this way, that a man who is influenced by a godly woman becomes a better man. I, I don't know of any time where my wife has ever manipulated me in a negative way. She could, because like the king, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Sometimes my cord doesn't reach the outlet. I mean, I'm just not the brightest bulb in the lamps. And so that, I, I get that. But instead, what it's been is 21 years of being influenced by a woman. Not by her demanding, not by her cajoling, not by her threatening, not by her pouting, but by her using everything that God has given her to influence me. I'll go on record saying this. She's in the room. I'm talking about her like she's not here, but I see you over there, babe. Um, the reality is there's been no other human being that's been more used in my life to help shape me into the, the likeness of Jesus. It, it, it's, it's my wife. You say, well, Jeff, that ought not be that way. 
You ought, you, ought, you, ought to be, you ought to have some pastor. Surely there's a podcast that could do that for you. <laughs> you ain't going to become holy by a podcast. So, ladies, I want to I say this before moving on to Haman, who we'll spend the remainder of our time on. Um, it's never too late to start being the right kind of woman. Never too late. And I'm not flattering you. I'm telling you a biblical truth. You're actually very powerful. And if you'll take all that God has poured into you and wants to pour into you, and you'll stay broken and contrite and humble before him, and if you'll ask him to elevate the motivation of love to the highest degree in your life, you will be an influencer. I would rather have influence than position any day. I, I, I believe what the Bible says about headship in the home. I know that's not popular. It's true. Male headship in the home. I believe in male headship in the church. But listen, that's positional. Just because a fellow has a position doesn't mean he's got the influence. And if he doesn't have the influence, he doesn't have the power. And so the reality is this. Listen, if I have to choose between having a position in the kingdom and have an influence of the kingdom, you can keep your position. I want influence. And so when you move with that kind of wisdom in the kingdom, ladies, that's where you can do great feats. There, there's a reason we're talking about Esther uh, 2,500 years after she lived. Why? She's an influencer. She shaped a nation. So let's talk about the bad guy in the last 15 minutes, and then we'll be gone. Because ultimately... The message is about the arrogance of Haman. I wanted to show you the intensity of Esther. I wanted to show you the ignorance of the king, because he really doesn't have a clue what's going on. As long as he's got a cup of wine in his hand, he seems to be happy. But let's, let's look at the evil of Haman. Look at his depravity. First of all, he was a very insecure man. Verses 9 and 10. So Haman leaves the feast, joyful and glad of heart. That's an Old Testament way of saying he was buzzed. And when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, remember Mordecai. Mordecai is the guy that would not bow to Haman. He's the only dude around that won't bow to Haman. That he saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him. Haman is filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh. He is a pathetic man. By the way, he is the second most highly positioned man in the empire. He's got the position, but he knows he doesn't have the influence. He has to control through threat. He has to control through legal edicts and decrees. The only thing he has, there's, there's only one reason people are bowing down to Haman. It's not because he's highly prized. It's because there's a threat against them if they don't. It's, it's this very thing that facilitate, facilitated the extermination decree on the Jews. When Haman found out that there was a guy named Mordecai that would not bow to him, and he found out it was because Mordecai only bows to Yahweh, the God of the Jews, when that word got back to Haman, Haman said, well, I can't have any other Jew not bowing to me. Let's kill all of the Jews. It was the fact that Haman couldn't get honor from Mordecai that actually created this whole atmosphere of execution and death. And so Haman's walking out, man. He has just had one of three seats at the royal dining table with beautiful Queen Esther and the amazing king. And he was the third guy, so he is like strutting out. His ego is 10 steps ahead of him. He comes out. He's like, hello? Hello? Yes, it's me. It is Haman. I am here. And he looks over, and there's one dude in the king's gate who won't stand up for him. And it's Mordecai. And immediately, the illusion of being somebody is crushed. And his insecurities take over. There was one guy he couldn't control. It is a pathetic way to live your life. Where your self-evaluation can't rise above the one who gives you the least applause. So you're only as good as your most ardent detractor allows you to be listen can i can i confess something here man i went through a, f a 
few years in ministry. And none of these people are around here anymore, so don't get thinking like that. But things would be going greatly, wonderfully. God's moving, people getting saved, people getting baptized, church was growing, ministry was expanding. But there'd always be those one or two guys out there, almost always men, almost always in my same peer group, rarely somebody older than me, almost never a woman, but guys, and I would just be, we'd have an awesome service, and I'd walk out, and some goofball would give me that stink eye, like, (laughs) and I'd get in the car, and I'd pull a Haman. Man, the church is dying because brother so-and-so didn't smile. He didn't say amen at all during my awesome sermon. Amy, I think the Lord's going to move us. And I've already told you what a great influencer is, and you can tell because I'm still here, amen. I withstood. But my point being is this. It's a terrible way to live your life being dominated by your insecurities that you only allow yourself as much joy as the person who doesn't treat you well. Come on, man. I mean, is that really what we're supposed to do? Man, you just ask the Holy Spirit to give you a healthy dose of, I don't care what you think. <laughs> That's not in the Bible, but somehow that felt really good right there. Just, Lord, endow me with the ability to not care what this person thinks about me. And so that resonated with a couple of you. I'm, I'm going somewhere now. So he was an insecure guy. Listen, everybody in the room has some insecurities. Every single one of us has some insecurities. Just make sure you have them and they don't end up having you. Because if you'll own your insecurities and you'll continue to bring them before the Lord and the faithful shepherd will take you out of that manure-filled pasture of insecurity and lead you into green pastures where you can be healthy and there'll be fresh streams and you can drink from. But if you pretend you don't have insecurities like Haman did, then you'll never get victory over him. So what am I talking about pretending like he didn't have them? Well, look in verse number 11 and 12. His pride would not allow him... To, to face reality. So look what he does. He was a prideful man. Haman calls his wife and his friends. He gets his pep rally team into his den, and he says he recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, the beauty queen, Let nobody but me come with the king to the feast that she had prepared. And by the way, tomorrow I'm going again. His, like, it's almost like he calls the congregation of his wife and his friends together. He says, I've got a great message to preach to you guys. We have a seat, have a seat. Today we're going to be talking about me. I am awesome. I am Haman, the awesomest. And he tells, he's telling his wife how much money he has. He's telling his friends about how many kids he has. He's going over his degrees of advancement in the kingdom. Have you ever met anybody like that? My goodness. If you haven't, just watch uh, the, the award shows. There, there probably is no more hysterical thing than Hollywood getting together and throwing a multi-million dollar party to applaud themselves. It's it's ridiculous. All of that is kind of boiled down and capsulized in Haman. And, and, And it's just, it's, hey, look at me. Are you looking at me? Just look a little longer. Check me out. What do you think? Don't tell me, let me tell you what you think. It's that kind of arrogance, and it's just exuding. What's amazing is he doesn't even see it. The most arrogant people you'll ever meet, the hardest thing about it is they don't know how arrogant they are. They have no idea. If you tell them how arrogant they are, they'll tell you, well, you're being very judgmental. (laughs) Not only am I great, I have awesome discernment, and you've got a critical spirit. And it's just silly, man. I mean, I have to laugh at it because this is the kind of guy that if I'm not walking a spirit, I just want to deck him, man. I just want to punch him. It's like, let's see if we can knock this pride out of this guy. But you can't. It's not a physical thing. 
he's, he's, he's dead in his soul. He's having to build himself up with accomplishments, achievements, his descendants, because, of course, in that culture, he had 10 sons. We'll find that out. By the way, they all die because of their dad. It's, it's, it's terrible what happens to, through this man. And, and then he's saying, I, I got to eat with the king and the queen today. That would have been new news. Nobody would have known that. And he said, by the way, she asked me to come back tomorrow. And so he is, he is just sensing the increase of his own greatness. But there's one little pesky problem, and his name is Mordecai. Last verses. We find because of Mordecai that Haman was a ruthless man. Pride, arrogance, insecurities, they lead to really bad things coming from people like that if it's not dealt with. He says, all of this is worth nothing to me. All of the stuff he just laid out before them. So long as I see, just smell the anti-Semitism on this. As long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. The Bible says his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, let a gallows 50 cubits high, that's about 75 feet high, be made. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. And then go joyfully to the king, with the king to the feast. And Haman says, that's it. The Bible says the idea pleased Haman. Have I been calling him Naaman? I mean to say Haman. I hope I haven't been calling him Naaman. And the Bible says that he had the gallows made. If you have a Bible that you write in, circle that last little phrase. He had the gallows made because those gallows are going to be used in just a short time for something completely different than what Haman had in mind. But watch this, and we're going to be done. I I think there's a certain measure which we can kind of make fun of the self-important individual that really thinks that the, the earth orbits around them. But I'm going to tell you, in its most extreme case, insecure, powerful people almost always turn destructive. Uh, There's a reason why the rate of domestic abuse just continues to grow and grow. It is typically because the abuser is deeply insecure and can only control through threat, violence, and intimidation. Haman's that guy, but about a thousand times worse. So, and Haman, unfortunately, has people that enable him all around him. He's got a wife, and it's just she's the antithesis of what Esther is. Esther's being humble and gracious and spirit-guided and led of the Lord and, and operating in wisdom for something glorious to happen. Zeresh, the wife of Haman, says, oh, if you've got Mordecai that's a problem, just build, it says a gallows. That's our English word, and when we think of gallows, we think of, you know, the wild, wild west where they would hang somebody Uh, with a noose off a platform that would drop out from under him. It's actually different. The Persian hangings were actually spikings. They would build a a spike, a tree, a pointed, sharpened piece of metal or wood, and they would literally throw the victim and impale them upon it. And so what is being described here is a platform 75 feet in the air that would be above some form of a spike, and that in the morning— that Mordecai is to be taken up there under the authority of the king, thrown off and impaled. It was an agonizing death. And they would, in essence, be impaled on a tree. Uh, That's language that also refers to the Roman crucifixion of our king and our Lord Jesus Christ. But it was different in Persia. So Haman is riding the roller coaster of insecurity, feeling great when people are, are, are telling him that he's valuable, feeling terrible when one individual refuses to obey the edict of honor. Stand up when Haman rides by. Mordecai says, I ain't standing up. I mean, there's something good because Mordecai, by the way, don't forget, Mordecai already knew there was a sentence of death over all the Jews. Now, what's he got to lose? You know, stand up and honor Haman. Haman's the guy that ordered the death. Let Let me just give you this. When you die to what people think of you, you'll start op- operating at a high level of kingdom integrity. 
when you're dead to the opinions of others, you will start stepping in to a place in the kingdom that you've never been in before. But I'm going to tell you, you can't get there until you enter in the process of dying to what other people think of you. Now, I don't want people to think poorly of me. Um, I, I, my testimony is important to me. I don't, want, I don't want to do anything to reflect poorly on the Lord or my family or this church or anything, the gospel. I don't want my actions to reflect poorly. But even when you do everything you can do to walk in integrity and holiness and uprightness and walk according to the Lord, you're going to have some people that aren't going to like you. They're going to talk about you. They're, they're just going to be some straight, straight up, folks. Listen, there's going to be some people that no matter what you do, as often as you do it, as pure as your motives are, bending over backwards, doing everything right, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, giving them the coat off your back, you can do it all right, and they're still going to give you the stink eye. And you got to decide what kind of woman, what kind of man are you going to be in light of that? Are they going to be the ones that determine your outlook, your value, the level of your joy, your commitments and kingdom? For Mordecai, he's like, hey, Haman, I'm already dead. Why would I give you honor when I've already died to this system you're trying to get me to bow to? And so he doesn't do it. So Haman goes to bed. Somewhere in the night sky there in the capital of Susa, he hears nails on wood as a, a bunch of servants are working through the night building a 75-foot platform that tomorrow morning... Haman can just envision it, that Jew Mordecai is going to get what's coming to him. Tune in next time and come and see what the sovereign God of heaven does. Will you stand to your feet? There are a few books in the Bible that have that kind of vibe, but this is kind of like a to be continued. It's like a saga, it really is. Let me pray for you. Father, free your people to stand in what you have spoken over us and to not flinch under the reality of what other people speak of us. Father, never allow us to stop loving and caring for people in that way. But God, give us, please, Father, an elevated ability to walk away unaffected from those who will never support us, never applaud us, and never believe in us. Help us to love them, but not to need their affirmation. And in this way, we ask you to strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen.